Welcome to the F-Tier Nuzlocke, a run where I take what are considered the worst Pokemon and prove that one man's trash is all this man gets to use in his Nuzlocke. I've done this run two times before, and if you're new here, I highly recommend you check those out after this one. Assuming you like this one, of course. But if you do like this one, you'll probably like those ones. And since that means I make videos you like, you should also subscribe, since I'll definitely be making more videos you like in the future. For this run, we are again combining the list made by Pokemon Challenges and Flygon HG, so our list of viable encounters looks like this. Go ahead and tell me why these Pokemon aren't bad in the comments below. I didn't make the list, though I might before the next run. Stay tuned till the end to learn more about that and how you could help me make encounter tables for future runs. And real quick, if I sound a little under the weather, it's because I am. I put off reading the script until the last possible minute to see if my voice would get better, and it still hasn't, so bear with me. Hardcore Nuzlocke rules apply, let's run with it. Stuffed into the back of a moving van, we begin the third installment of our trilogy of F-tier Nuzlocke by arriving in Hoenn. We can skip the story preamble of meeting the awkward girl next door and run north to protect the professor after selecting our starter Mudkip. We choose Mudkip not because we can use him, but because he'll make the best HM user later if and when we need it. There is a lot of water in Hoenn, after all. After we meet the professor back at his lab, he directs us to find his daughter May, and oh look, it's the same awkward neighbor. We take her out easily and are rewarded with Pokeballs for our efforts. Finally, our run can begin. On Route 1, we catch Skolesi the Wormple, who we quickly evolve into Dustox thanks to our level cap. Dustox is by no means a bad Pokemon. It's actually quite good for a lot of the game. But considering that this is the only Pokemon we get that I can say that about, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. With Skelessi in tow, we easily skip up to Petalburg, where some story stuff happens, this kid named Wally gets a route, it's all very cute. Anyway, in Petalburg Woods, we find this guy getting cornered by some other guy in blue pajamas, so we kick the grunt to the curb and save the guy with the goods he was carrying. God, I hope they're cupcakes. Past Rustboro on Route 116, we have two possible encounters, Skitty and Nakata. Skitty is much rarer of an encounter, and also not who I'm looking for. Delcatty had her chance last time. This time we run into Taka the Nakata and have now secured every encounter before the first gym. The Rock Gym. Two bug types. Oh boy. Roxanne is our first major battle, and honestly, when planning this out, is where I saw the biggest threat to the possibility of this run. So much so, in fact, that I almost considered opening a new encounter of, I don't know, CDOT or something. In this reality, though, we lead with Skelessi, hoping that Confusion hitting on Roxanne's weaker special defense might be just enough to sweep, but no dice. Confusion doesn't even two-shot, and Rock Tomb, though we dodged the first one, deals more damage than we'll be able to survive, especially with our speed dropping. Fun fact, our Skelessi actually has a minus special attack nature, which isn't great luck, considering we probably would have two shot if it wasn't, but no matter. We stay in while Roxanne uses a potion, and even though Geodude gets off a second Rock Tomb, we manage to pick up the KO. Unfortunately now, Skelessi is very much in danger of getting KO'd by Roxanne's other two Pokemon. Without much choice, we swap to Taka, who takes a neutral Rock Tomb thanks to his ground typing. Speaking of that ground typing, did you know that the only ground type move Nakata learns this early is Sand Attack? The Bastard doesn't even get Mud Slap until, get this, level 31. Anyway, we are going to be utilizing the one ground move that we do have and play into the biggest weakness of rock types, accuracy. Most rock moves aren't 100% accurate. We already saw that when Roxanne's first rock tomb missed just naturally. With sand attack, we are able to sit in front of Roxanne's nose pass and lower its accuracy until it just can't drop further. While we do that, the AI switches gears at the same time and starts boosting its own defense with Harden. It does get off another rock tomb, but it wastes another turn going for block as well to prevent us from switching out. But Taka isn't going anywhere, buddy. He's not locked in here with you, you're locked in here with him. After nose pass accuracy is lowered as much as it can be, we start going for hard in ourselves. Now, even if Roxanne does get a hit off, it won't be doing much of anything. With both Pokemon's defense as high as they can go, but with our opponent having the lowest possible accuracy and being forced to only use tackle, we can start dealing our chip damage with Leech Life. I just hope we have enough PP to get through this. Leech Life deals decent damage, all things considered, and starts healing us back up from 10 HP. Knowing I'll want to save some of that PP for Geodude to heal even more, we pivot into Fury Swipe to start whittling away at nose pass's remaining HP. The long and short of it is, Taka wins the War of Attrition. By the time Geodude comes out, it's already too late. A couple of Leech Life steals enough damage to keep us alive, while Geodude falls. There weren't many options available to us, but it turns out Ninkata was the only one we needed. Our first badge in hand, we continue onwards, where we're now able to access Rust Turf Tunnel and catch ourselves Phono the Whismur. He's just a little guy. And then this bozo shows up again, having stolen somebody's bird and those damn cupcakes, so we beat him up, return both, and as a thanks for our good deed, we are given... Chores. Oh, and a phone map 
thing, I guess. Lucky us. Anyway, now we feel obligated to give this letter to a company president's son, so we hop aboard a boat to Duford and beeline first and foremost for its gym, where we can take on Brawley. Brawley is like the opposite of Roxanne, at least in the case that he should be a pushover for our tag team of bugs. We lead Scalesi, who again starts off with confusion, but now it goes the way I wish it would have against Roxanne, and gets a critical hit KO on Brawley's lead Machop. Meditate proves to be annoying, since it isn't weak to Psychic and keeps boosting its defense with Reflect and Bulk Up, so Gust deals less and less damage. Yeah, this is Gen 3 flying moves are all physical for some reason. This won't be the last time this detail comes up, so in case you didn't know, before Generation 4, moves being physical or special was dependent purely on their type. Doesn't matter if it's Gust or Wing Attack, both are physical. Doesn't matter if it's Water Gun or Waterfall, both are special. Yeah, it sucked, but as kids, it's not like we knew better anyway, so whatever. Brawly's Metatite can't actually attack you if you keep attacking it, since that will cause it to break focus, and then focus punch will fail, so eventually it falls anyway. Makahita comes out, and since we four times resist his only attacking move, we KO it with confusion easily. Two badges under our belt already. Next, since I'm no one's messenger boy, I'm a delivery boy, it's time to take our letter to Steven. We stock up on Repels and begin our trek through Granite Cave. Repel is important here because we don't want to run into Zubat, who is a viable encounter. Granite Cave is the only place where we can find Nose Pass, and we can guarantee that encounter by coming back later after obtaining Rock Smash. So anyway, letter delivered. Now we boat up to Slateport City, where there must be an event going on at the local museum. I mean, look at that line, and start our search for the guy these cupcakes are actually supposed to be delivered to. We're told he's in the museum, so we head back that way and deliver the goods. Before we can even apologize for half of them going mysteriously missing, we're jumped by two more blue pajama hooligans who are promptly smashed into pieces across the floor where they belong. Their leader comes in, shouts something about the sea, and they all run off. Yeah, I definitely stumbled into some kind of improv play. Goods delivered and our obligations cleared, we march north from Slateport and run to May again. Remember her? She's supposed to be our rival. It's cute. Wingle is taken out with poison stings now that Scalisi has finally learned a stab move, keeping herself alive with protect and moonlight between bouts of confusion. Slugma comes in next and we swap to Phono, now evolved into a Loudred. We lock into Uproar and Slugma falls in two turns. Grovile comes in next and we're still locked into Uproar, but that's fine as May goes for pursuit and we deal half damage in return. By the time she snaps out of it and starts using Absorb, it's too little too late and Grovile Falls. She gives us the item finder, which I'll use later off camera to dig up some heart scales, but that's about it. In Mauville City, we run into that kid Wally again, who asks us to kick his ass in front of his own uncle. Strange request, but we follow through. Now we have some real prep work to do. The third gym is never a pushover in any iteration of Hoenn, so we want to be as prepared as possible. Watson's Magneton is a steel type, and right now we have zero answers to it. And that's not even his scariest Pokemon. He's got an exploding Voltorb and a Manetrix, so we have our work cut out for us. Heading west to Route 117 for our next encounter, which is Volby. Okay, maybe he doesn't solve our Watson issues, but he took me forever to find. He is a 1% encounter for some reason. So we're adding photo to the team anyway, all right? Next, we have access to the game corner, which means we have access to slots, which means we have access to coins, which means we have access to some crazy good TMs like Ice Beam and Psychic, and most importantly for our Watson problem, Flamethrower, a move that Phono just so happens to be able to learn for some reason. And that's the most we can do, actually. Give us a fodder mod if necessary and an answer to Magneton. I guess it's Watson time. He leads with Voltorb while we lead with Scalesi. And for reasons unknown to anyone, Watson decides to self-destruct on turn one. Well, I had hoped to bait that better and block it with Protect, but uh, it only did half, so I guess we're good? This works? Question mark? Electrike is in next and we actually get off a Poison Sting while his Shockwave activates our Orin Berry. We can Moonlight the next turn while he howls and then Poison Sting gets off the Poison while we take another Shockwave. We then alternate attacks and protects to keep our HP up while Watson decides to heal away from the inevitable, but eventually Electrike falls to a side beam and next comes in Magneton. We hard swap into Phono, who immediately becomes paralyzed and then he gets hit with a Shockwave, reducing a third of his HP. Any amount of bad luck with Paralysis, and this could be over here and now, but fortunately, that doesn't happen, and Phono gets off the flamethrower. Magneton falls to the one-hit KO. Gen 3 doesn't have buff sturdy, so take that. Elmer sends his regards. Manetric comes into play, and we decide to stay in and try to get off the supersonic while it howls. Of course, it misses, and the next turn Phono's paralyzed, but since Manetric goes for howl three times in a row, we do eventually get the confusion off. Now we can swap into our fodder Pokemon Photo, and spam Double Team while trying to keep it confused. Double Team won't prevent us from getting hit by Shockwave, but it will affect the quick attack he keeps building his attack stat for. Besides, all we're trying to do is get as much damage off as possible before Photo falls, so we aren't risking one of our better Pokemon. I mean, not like a Volbeat is gonna make it to the Elite Four, right? <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, when Photo drops to 3 HP, we do make the free switch into Taka, knowing the shockwave is coming, but Manetric actually just KOs itself in confusion. Our luck seems to be turning around even if just a little bit. Everyone survives another day, and another gym badge is ours to claim. Onward and upward, we run through the fiery path for our next encounter, Slugma, a 10% encounter. Why do all the bad mons have such low encounter rates? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't you want to reward your players for spending time playing your game instead of letting them down without remorse? Anyway, Igneo the Slugma is added to the team. We quickly run through Falarbor Town and pick up our next encounter of Ophidio the Sviper. I think that's how you pronounce that. Sviper saw some use in our last F tier Nuzlocke, but unlike in White 2, it really isn't outclassed by much here. It has good mixed offenses, a decent move pool to use it, and nothing really bodies it, so it makes it onto the team. In a generation without physical special split, being able to take advantage of your coverage options is a lot more impressive than you might think. We have one more encounter coming up, and that's our Zubat, finally, in Meteor Falls. We name him Nikdo and box him for now, but never bad to have a backup. Golbat's biggest loss in this generation is not having access to fly. Wing attack just doesn't really cut it, you know? Anyway, there's guys in red pajamas now. They're yelling at a professor about a rock or something. Honestly, don't know. I was too busy chasing bats. Blue pajama guys come in and scare the red pajama guys off, and they all run out of the cave yelling and screaming. So I do what any sensible kid would do and follow them straight back up the mountain. Reaching the peak, we see a lot of dog fighting going on, and before PETA can have a field day, we run into the red pajama leader, Maxi, who I guess is actually wearing more of a chef's coat, but who am I to judge? what somebody wears to bed. He leads with Mighty Anna, and we leave with Taka, now a full-fledged ninjask. We swords dance to make up for the lost attack from Intimidate, and then some, only taking a sand attack for our troubles, and then next turn score the one-hit KO with Leech Life. Next, Camera is out, and we should take one hit since it really only has Ember to use against us, so we try and hit Fury Swipes, but miss. Well, it was worth the shot. Now we swap in a photo. Time for double team shenanigans. Camera Upt eventually starts going for magnitude, even though we resist, and I still couldn't tell you why. I know AI gets weird when you start messing with accuracy and evasion, but like, I still didn't think it would go for a resisted move when it has both super effective and neutral options. Weird. Anyway, thanks to Moonlight, we can stay in, get a few tail glows up, and start blasting with Signal Beam. This fight marks the first time I completely spaced on the physical special split, but I guess that explains why Signal Beam wasn't getting stronger. Oh well. Hindsight is 2020. We still tank everything Camera Upt throws at us and eventually do take it out with Signal Beam. Zubat in next and we can't stay in for lack of PP, so we swap in his Kalesi and take it out with Confusion. Maxi runs off, Archie thanks us for not allowing hundreds to die from a forced explosion of the volcano, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I was doing. Now we can go to Leverage Town. <laughs> just kidding. Backtracking time. Fun fact, I did more backtracking in this game than in both of my previous runs combined, and I had to do quite a bit in white too, mostly for my own stupidity. Hoenn just loves to make you walk in loops, but don't worry, I cut out most of it. Just know I did it all for you guys, so you should probably leave a like on the video because little number going up makes brain happy. Back in Granite Cave, we smash rocks until one comes to life, and we are able to catch Anamatano the Nose Pass. Then we level up, walk back to Leverage, and we can finally challenge Flannery for the next gym badge. Not as worried about this one as Roxanne or Watson, but Fire is still still scary when most of our team options are insects. We lead with Nikto, now a Golbat, against Flannery's Numel. Wing attack almost takes out Numel in one hit, but it survives and gets up a sunny day. Just my luck. Well, whatever. Flannery uses a super potion to save her Numel, but it follows with back-to-back -back attacks, meaning we've wasted a few turns of the sun already. Maybe we'll be alright. Mostly, we don't want anything to take a sun boosted overheat if we can help it. We can't, but it's nice to think we have a plan. Slugma comes in next and actually does fall to a single wing attack, but when Camerup comes out, now we're scared. We salute Nikto, our suicide lead to deal as much damage as possible and take out the weaklings, as he is hit with a boosted overheat and lives on 9 HP. Well, that was anticlimactic. Now that Camera Up's special attack is dropped, we can safely swap into Automatano. Unlike Maxi's Camera Up, Flannery doesn't have any ground moves on hers, so we aren't in any danger on that front. With another overheat and special attack drop, I wonder if we can get cheeky with it and swap into Taka, but Flannery immediately goes for the attract and we fall hopelessly in love. Oh, and so does Taka. Automatano comes in and meets the same fate, but unlike Taka, we actually have the defenses to waste a few turns, so we start spamming Rock Slide until Camera Up eventually falls. Torkoal is Flannery's last Pokemon, and it also has a tract. So before it can get that off, we quickly paralyze it with Thunder Wave. It actually gets paralyzed the same turn, and then we play for Para Flinch by again spamming Rock Slide. We miss one while Torkoal sets up the sun, but it doesn't matter. Next turn we get the critical hit, and Torkoal falls. Four badges deep in a Hoenn, and believe it or not, I'm only just now thinking this full run might actually be possible. May meets us outside the gym, stalker much, and gives us some weird goggles, but she clearly didn't look at our encounter list because we have no reason whatsoever to ever enter the desert in this run. 
So moving on. And that means a bit more backtracking the Pedalberg where we have to take on the normal gym. The gym trainers don't pose too much of a threat, but we do get this fun moment in one of the rooms. My Viper decimated the Zangoose, by the way. Norman leads Spinda, and that's annoying enough on its own, but even worse is it survives a dig after having its defense lowered with Screech. Then it confuses us with Teeter Dance, and we're forced to switch. Taka comes in while Norman heals, but we swap back to Ophidio, and this time just go for the head with Poison Tail and get the KO. Definitely overthought that one a little bit, but no harm, no foul. Against Norman's Vigoroth, we bring in Automatano. We then just want to get off a few Hardens to keep our health up, but we actually get Encored into it twice, so we spend a lot more time setting up than I realistically meant to. We do eventually get the Thunder Wave off, though, and go back to our pair of flinch shenanigans, keeping Vigoroth in place for two turns, getting a critical hit, and KOing on the third. That'll teach you to Encore me. Next in is Norman's scariest Pokemon, Slacking. We stay in, not really knowing what it's going for, but just hoping to take a hit. Expecting Faint Attack, since it's a special move, our defense is high, and it's what Vigoroth was using. Imagine my surprise when it launches off a counter after our rock slide and we survive on literally one HP. Well, my life just flashed before my eyes. I should have been more outgoing in high school. We take advantage of the slackers loafing around and freely switch into Skelessi. We then proceed to protect the next turn and every other turn from there to prevent slacking from doing much of anything to us. We're betting on poison here activating and dealing a lot of chip damage, then hopefully confusing it with Psy Beam and maybe dealing extra damage that way. But slacking has a Citrus Berry and Norman has a potion, and if we run out of Protect PP before it dies, then that boosted facade is gonna hurt. I'm getting weird Conkeldur flashbacks. Fortunately, none of that happens, and the slacking goes down without any damage to Skelessi dealt. Linoon is Norman's last Pokemon, and it does have Belly Drum, should it decide to go for it, which could be scary. But even though it's dealing decent damage with Facade, we are able to heal that damage back with Moonlight and eventually outlast the Weasel, KOing with Psybeam. Now that we've unlocked the ability to Surf, we break out our Storage Mud Kip, which everyone should have, and pick up the Good Rod from across the same route we fought May. Then we can Surf back and fish ourselves up a Corefish. Crawdon is an amazing Pokemon in any generation other than this one. This isn't your adaptability Dragon Dance Aqua Jet knockoff Crawdon. This is your slow as molasses hyper cutter both stabs are special Crawdon. It is outclassed by anything else with a water typing. But we don't have anything else with a water typing. Yay! Ostracano is a badass name, so we evolve her and add her to the team immediately. Making our full circle complete, we end up in Mauville again, where Watson gives us a chore to power the underground generator, so we do. Normally, you can find some good electric types in here, but since I said good, that means we get nothing. Well, we do get the Thunderbolt TM, but like, I already have four from the game corner. Why Loudred can get Flamethrower, Ice Beam, and Shockwave, but not Thunderbolt, is something I will never understand. Anyway, finally allowed to go to someplace new, we run up Route 119 and find the Weather Institute filled with blue pajama fiends having the worst kind of sleepover. One with hostages. We make our way through the Institute, find the leader, she calls us cute, and I'm like, stop it, no you, and then she tries to kill us. Now that's hot. But anyway, we lead with Taka, set up a sword stance, and sweep her two Pokemon's leech life. For our troubles, though, the hostages reward us with Cast Form, who we know is very much a viable encounter, because for all intents and purposes, his gimmick is awful, and he just sucks. Is what a lesser man might say. I have taken a scene Cast Form in a new light since using Tweety and White 2, and Astra will carry on her legacy here in Emerald. We run into May here again, but she is as much of a pushover as she is every time. Ostracano one shot Slugma with a rain boosted Surf, then Skelessi eats Grovile and Lombre alive with Poison Sting. In Fortree City, there's these random invisible walls that Steven, yes, the same Steven, gives us a scope lens to be able to see. Wow, they're actually Pokemon? Who could have thought? Anyway, we beat up a couple chameleons and head inside the gym for our next battle. Winona leads with a Swablu, a poor choice. We lead with Astra and set up the hail. It begins again. With Weather Ball now boosted to 100 base power and ice type, we fire the one hit KO into Swablu. Skarmory comes out and we shift gears, setting up the sun to resist damage from Steel Wing, but it only goes for Sand Attack for some reason. Now a fire type move, Weather Ball gets the one shot on Skarmory as well. Pelipper comes in next and we swap to Automatano, who is relatively safe thanks to the sun weakening Pelipper's water type moves. But it decides to go for Protect too many turns in a row, so we KO with Rock Slide after Thunder Wave holds it in place. Tropius doesn't pose a huge threat, but it does have Chlor chlorophyll and solar beam and a sunny day of its own. So we swap into Nikno while it sets up Sun. Despite its speed being doubled, we still outspeed the Tropius and land a critical hit KO with Wing Attack. I take back what I said about Wing Attack not cutting it. Against Winona's Ace Altaria, we land a Confuse Ray and force it to hit itself in Confusion, then swap to Ostracano. Altaria Dragon Dances, and Ostracano lands the one shot Ice Beam. Another gym falls, and another badge earned. We continue on to Lily Cove City, where now that we've unlocked Fly, we can backtrack all the way to Rustboro for another encounter. I didn't even know this place existed until this run, but apparently, if you just 
keep surfing north of Rustboro, there's this little hidden part of the route with trainers and berries and items and everything, and it's the only place you can find wild Jigglypuff. We name her Somni, and though I'm not sure if she'll see much use, it's always nice to have a backup generic normal type. Now it's time for more story stuff. We travel to Mount Pyre, where blue pajamas are waiting for us at the top, but they just kind of leave without doing much of anything. All we really know is that the red guys have the blue orb, and the blue guys have the red orb, and they both think that's right for some reason. No wonder they can't get primals to activate in this game. Mans can't even see color. Oh, and we also grab the Shadow Ball TM while we're here. This will be important later. Anyway, we chased the red pajama guys down to their underground pillow fort, and one guy brought a lizard, so they were like, hey, let's shine the orb on it, so they did, and it got scared and jumped out of the fort and made a big ol' mess, and now we gotta fight Maxi again. We leave Taka and start setting up swords dances, but get confused in the process. We then risk it for the biscuit and snag the one-shot and Mighty Enna with Leech Life. Critical hit Slash also downs the camera up, then Slash one-shots Crobat as well. For the record, if we hit ourselves on any of those turns, Taka would be very, 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 very dead. But our weird speedy ninja bug lives another day. Okay, full disclosure, for most of this run, I was trying to get Taka killed so that I didn't bring him to the Elite Four, but he just kept living. He's worse than a roach, I swear. Like, come on, this should not have been a sweep for him. It just shouldn't have been. I need deaths. I need content. But no! Lucky, lucky us. In Slateport, we find Blue Pajama Guy stealing a sub, and we're like, hey, I'm hungry too, but they don't share and take off with the sub all for themselves. So we do the only sensible thing and track them down to their base of operations, and at the back of it, one guy is like, haha, the sub is gone, you just missed it, and then he tries to murder us. The natural progression of things. Not very successfully, though, as Taka makes quick work of his Mighty Anna, and Fono, now a beautiful x takes out his Golbat. Struggling to see the ocean connection here with his Pokemon, but I digress. Forced to give up on our sub search for for now, we make our way to Moss Deep City where our next gym battle awaits. This time against two gym leaders because that's a thing we enjoy. Tate and Liza lead with Zatu and Claydol while we lead with Fono and Ostracano. My original idea was to lead with Astra and fire off some rain boosted surfs, but Zatu is carrying Sunny Day for reasons and one use of that would shut everything down horribly, so we opt in the brute force option instead. Two turns of double ice memes take out both Zatu and Claydol. Watching this back, I definitely could have picked targets better to at least avoid the second earthquake, but I did go in expecting the need to take two, so I'm not too bothered. By it. Lunatone and Solrock come in next, so we swap Fauno to Astra and knock off the Solrock. Or would, but we hit ourselves in confusion thanks to Zatu's lingering confusory. Solrock sets up the sun while Lunatone goes for Calm Mind. We might be in some trouble here. Solrock is very likely going for Solar Beam, so we play into that and use Rain Dance with Astra, which will lock Solrock into a two turn move and boost the power of Surf, which very nearly takes out the Solrock altogether while Lunatone just goes for another Calm Mind. Solar Beam is still gonna hurt, so we double into it just in case Ostracano doesn't get the attack off for any reason, and Weather Ball KOs the Soul Rock. Astra is then put to sleep by Lunatone's Hypnosis, but with Surf now being a single target move, it takes out the Lunatone in the same turn. Taint and Liza are both defeated, seven gems down. Despite their lack of Lizard, Red Pajamas are still making trouble up at the Space Center, so we gotta root them out. Steven is inside already, so he teams up with us for a double battle against Maxi and his admin. We're only allowed three Pokemon in this fight, but that shouldn't be an issue. We lead Ostracano, who immediately gets confused by Mighty Anna Swagger, but she powers through and Surf takes out Camerupt. Then we snap out of confusion and take out the incoming Golbat with Ice Beam without much issue. We get confused again, not just once, but twice. Double Swagger maxes out our already naturally high attack and confuses us. Hitting ourselves at this point will hurt but their Pokemon aren't particularly strong, so I'm not too worried about having to tank a hit or two. Luckily, we power through this turn and slam both Mighty Anna and the new Crobat with Surf anyway. The next turn, Metang takes out the other Mighty Anna, but Ostracano hits herself in confusion. We're still sitting at half HP though, so I don't think much of it. Besides, we should snap out of it soon. The next turn though, we hit ourselves in confusion again, activating our own Citrus Berry, while Crobat locks us into place with Mean Look. See, this double sucks because if I had hit myself twice, I definitely would have swapped out this turn, but now I can't. But like I said, confusion should wear off, right? Crobat hits Ostracano with Wing Attack, and then, for the third time in a row, she hits herself in confusion. This time, Ostracano falls. That death hurt. I definitely could have gotten out of that death list if I just played a little safer and swapped earlier, or if I had just gotten a little luckier. But it is what it is. We lost a powerhouse, but that just means the rest of the team will have to step up in her place. Phono swaps in, and Ice Beam easily KOs the Crobat. Camerupt is Maxi's last Pokemon, and combination of Strength and Psychic taken out before it can move. With their leader defeated once again, Red Pajamas run off. We meet Steven in his home on the island, where he gives us the HM for dive. We strap onto our trusty Mudkip and make for open waters. My rumbling stomach reminds me we have a mission to complete. We track 
track the sub to an underwater pillow fort, not the weirdest place I've ever eaten a sandwich, where we find a whale sitting at the bottom after some weird rock puzzles and Archie corners us into a fight. We mirror our same lead against Maxi and set up sword stands with Taka. We get confused for our efforts, but hit through with Leech Life anyway and KO the Mighty Enna. When Crobat comes out, we hit the slash, but miss the KO and get confused again. God, these guys are worse than Zubat, I swear. We swap in Automatano while Archie heals a bit, and since the most he can do is rely on hacks from bite flinches and confusion, we eventually hit two rock slides and take him out. Against Sharpedo, we swap into Skelessi, get confused because of course we do, and hit a boosted Silver Wind for the KO. Angry in his defeat and clearly not thinking straight, Archie looks at the whale and is all like, let's shine the orb on it, so he did, and it got scared and jumped out of the fort and made a big old mess, and now Maxi is here again. Steven shows up and tells us that more story is going to happen in Zootopolis, but we have another encounter to get first, so that's just going to have to wait. Underwater, we can find a Relicanth, and we throw a Pokeball at it that catches it rather easily, even at full health. Nifty. We name him Thalasso and add him to the team. We then enter Cetopolis and whoa, cutscene. Excuse me. Ex excuse me. Excuse me. We're told we gotta enter this cave and talk to this guy, and this guy tells us to go find a snake, so we find the snake, the snake flies off, tells the lizard and whale to go back to the pillow forts, and then leaves. I'm just saying, when it boils down to it, there's really a whole lot of no consequences going on around here, aren't there? I mean, the weather should be messed up, like, forever now, but nah, airlock, baby. Anyway, now we get to go fight the final gym, headed by Juan. He leaves with a love disc because he too is a fellow connoisseur of F-tier Pokemon. Unfortunately for him, this allows us to set up everything we could ever want in our Ninjask, and then Baton pass out to our Relicanth, who I know cannot sweep this gym entirely, but will be fun while it lasts. Ancient Power takes out Love Disc, Wish Cash, Celio, and Crawdont but Kingdra is the real kicker. We yawn first to bait out the use of Kingdra's Chesto Berry. We then dive to avoid damage, but come up just to get confused by Water Pulse anyway. Yawn eventually hits again, despite Double Team Spam, but I guess I can't be too mad about that myself, now can I? We decide to try and chip damage the Kingdra, but a four times resist is hard to break. After hitting another yawn, we swap out into Astra, thinking we could fire off some neutral Ice-type Weather Balls, but no. Kingdra wakes up, gets a critical hit Ice Beam, and that's where that plan ends. Automatano comes out, gets immediately confused, and rushes back into his Pokeball, it's like he was never here at all. Finally, Skelessi comes out, and despite the number of evasion boosts on Kingdra, we have Moonlight to keep us in the fight long enough to get the toxic poison on it. Now we can sit, protect, and- Oh, right, rest. I- Uh, okay. Phono, you're the only one that hasn't had a chance against this thing, so come in, make use of your shockwave that can't miss, and get a critical hit for good measure, would you? That's a good boy. Thanks, Phono. All eight gym leaders behind us, not a single death to any of them. Feeling pretty good about that. Now we're free to make our way to Evergrande City, but before we can continue onwards to the Elite Four, we have two more possible encounters that I want to pick up, mostly because at this point I really had no idea what my team was going to be, so I want to make sure I had all my possible options. Way too much annoying fishing later, we get both Philo the Love Disc and Tripo the Corsola. At several different points during this run, I want you to know I did consider using a Calm Mind Corsola, but just couldn't bring myself to do it. Maybe next time. Wally confronts us in Victory Road, and we're forced into another rival fight. Since our actual rival couldn't make it, I guess they replaced her with this guy? Anyway, he leads Altaria, who falls to Fono's Ice Beam, then his Delcaddy gets Flamethrower to death after he tries to heal our Water Pulse damage off. Magneton also gets Flamethrower to death, as does Roselia. Finally, Gardevoir gets confused with Water Pulse, then we swap into Thalasso, and Ancient Power takes it out. Maybe in the remakes, buddy. Now it's time to do some prep work, and finally tackle the Elite Four. Our team is looking strong. Taka and Skelessi have been here from the very beginning, despite my best efforts, and are a clear and obvious answer to Dark Types, and generally okay against the rest of the E4 as well. Thalasso covering Ostracano's spot as a generally good water type, but being particularly good against Ice Types. Astro makes the cut as our best Dragon answer, as we've clearly seen before, and Ophidio has a really strong type matchup against Phoebe's Ghosts. We even bring Photo along, partly for fodder, partly because he's my only Pokemon that can learn Thunderbolt, and that'll help against Glacia and Wallace if he survives that long. But that means we have an answer for every member of the Elite Four, except this feels a little off. I know they're perfectly viable encounters, but we've already seen Cast Form and Viper make it into the Elite Four. Using them again, at least so soon, feels like it goes against the heart of the challenge. The point of the F tier run isn't to use bad Pokemon, despite what the title of this video may lead you to believe, but to use Pokemon that are generally considered just worse than others. Pokemon that you may never think to use otherwise, or you might not go out of your way to find. And that means there has to be other options waiting for us. We swap a video for Phono, another one that's been with us for a while. It doesn't really fill the same niche against Ghosts, but he is at least immune, and it's more correct to say he's taking the spot of Astra on the team, since Ice Beam gives us a great dragon answer against Drake. Then Astra gets boxed in replacement of Igneo, who may actually be an okay answer against most of Glacia's team. Only one of her Pokemon have a water type move, after all. Now that there's a lot less reliance on few specific members, everyone on the team is going to really have to pull their weight. But let's not waste any time on the preamble. Let's get straight into our first fight against Sydney. For this run, I'm choosing 
choosing to match the level cap of each Elite Four member as we go, it feels only fair. We lead Taka against Sydney's Mighty Enna, a fight all too familiar, but we set up a Swords Dance and use Protect for Speed Boost while we only take a Sand Attack and Double Edge in return. We can take one hit, maybe two with Citrus, but never more than that. So we take our first opportunity to Baton Pass out to Skelessi. Silverwind one-shots the Mighty Enna, and Shiftry, and Absol after a miss, but Cacturn dodges the attack thanks to those damn sand attacks from earlier, so we poison the cactus, then swap out to Photo, who gets a photo finish, you could say, cleaning up with a four time super effective signal beam. Next is Phoebe, and we need a good answer here because currently we do not. Fortunately, our Shadow Ball TM can be learned by three of our Pokemon, and since Ghost is a physical move in this game, we teach it to Skelessi. Let the games begin. Same lead, Taka gets a bunch of boosts and passes them on to Skelessi. Unfortunately, once she comes in, Dusclops puts her on a timer with Curse. But that won't stop us from wrecking havoc in the meantime, Shadow Ball takes out the Dusclops and Banette, and thanks to Citrus, the second Dusclops as well. When the next Banette comes out, we swap into Phono, are immune to the incoming Shadow Ball, and only eat a Will-O-Wisp while taking it out with Water Pulse. Was just kind of hoping Confusion would help that along the way, but I digress. Sableye comes in next, and it goes down to two Flamethrowers. Two Elite Four members defeated. Glacia is probably the Elite Four member we have the most members for, so I'm not particularly worried about it. What I do notice going in is that I forgot to level up to the next level cap. Uh oh, that probably won't matter, right? We get as many double team and speed boost turns in as possible, then Baton pass out to Igneo. We set up Sunny Day and start rock sliding, but this prompts Celio to set up Hail instead. So a bit of a weather war, is it? Eventually we take out the seal, but ideally we would have had Sun Up for the incoming Walrin, but I decide we'll likely outspeed, so if I really do want the Sun Up when it comes in, I can do that anyway. Ultimately, we probably aren't going to take a Surf if it hits Sun or no, so when Walrin comes out, we swap to Thalasso on the Surf and go for Yawn. While Walrin hits a sheer cold. Thalasso falls in just one hit. In a weird twist, Sheer Cold is actually more accurate for each level higher the user is than the target, 1% for each level. Not sure if the extra 2% mattered, but what did matter is, if I were going like normal and having a level cap to match the champion, then I would have outleveled the Walrin and Sheer Cold would have just failed every time altogether. But that's fine, it's still just 32%, we got unlucky. See? It even missed using it again! But not a third time. Skelessi meets the same frozen fate. Only three members in and we've already lost one third of our team. Phono comes in, avoids another sheer cold, and takes the wall run out with shockwave. The menace is down. Glalie is in next, which freezes Phono turn one? Is this quite possibly the unluckiest run I've ever had? Confusion, freezing, sheer cold. It's fine. I'm fine. Phono thaws out the next turn, hits a flamethrower, and a following shockwave takes it up. With Celio in next, we swap in a photo who, despite forcing Glacia's potion, gets hit with a tract, and we are forced to swap out to Igneo, who also gets attracted. After being immobilized three turns in a row, because my luck is what it is, we swap back in a photo, get off a thunderbolt, get attracted, swap back back into Igneo, eat the blizzard with four remaining HP, finally wear out the hail, and swap into Taka, expecting Celio to want to set up hail again, but instead we force a blizzard, get some speed boost, even get a sword dance off, not that I really think we need it, survive a double edge, break through immobilization of a on passing the photo, barely survive a double edge, and KO with Thunderbolt in return. <sighs> But the main thing here was making sure we outspeed Glalie, because now we have to heal if we're going to have any chance to get through this. We spam Moonlight until we're nearly back to full HP, then Signal Beam, because I remember it's physical finally and boosted my Sword Stance twice for the KO. A much harder fight than I could have possibly expected, and not sure it was entirely my fault. At least our only deaths were the sheer cold ones. Not really a crit to play around there, right? Eh? Spoiler alert! Drake isn't nearly as exciting. Taka raises his speed, then passes the baton to Phono, who is free to come in. Ice Beam, Ice Beam, Ice Beam, Ice Beam, Ice Beam. Ice Beam, Ice Beam, and Ice Beam. Wallace next. We lead Taka for the final time against Wallace's Whalelord. Difference here being that Whalelord carries a massive water spout that will absolutely KO Taka if it connects. So we go for double team and water spout hits anyway. We're down to three Pokemon against the champion, the furthest down we've ever been going into a fight. It is down to Volbeat, Exploud, and Megcargo to carry us through to the end. Photo is bulky, so if Wallace doesn't see the immediate KO with Water Spout, he'll likely go for Rain Dance instead. So we start with a Tail Glow to raise our special attack while he does exactly that. The next turn, Thunderbolt nearly KOs the Whale, and since Water Spout's damage is largely based on the user's HP, even boosted in the rain, it does almost nothing to us. Now, Wallace will be baited into using one of his full restores, which means we have a free turn to get a second Tail Glow. And then the following turn, we pick up the one-hit KO against Whalelord, and the fight is off and running. Tentacruel takes a Thunderbolt surprisingly well, and a Rain Boost 
Acid Hydro Pump hurts in return, but our Berry activates, keeping us above half HP, and we KO the next turn. Ludicolo in next actually can't do much to us, but also isn't weak to electric like most of Wallace's team. We take the opportunity to set up our last Tail Glow while it goes for double team. We then Moonlight to get our HP back to full and KO with two super effective signal beams while only taking one Surf in return, still staying at about two thirds HP. Wishcash in next is immune to Thunderbolt altogether, but three uses of signal beam, one being a critical hit, in between a little bit of Moonlighting to heal up, easily takes the fish out. Gyarados comes in and easily falls to Thunderbolt. Milotic comes in next, takes a critical hit Thunderbolt and falls just as quickly. Wallace has no more Pokemon that can battle. Player defeated, champion Wallace. In a way, I guess it's only fitting that the run that starts with only having bugs ends with only using them. But I certainly never expected a Volbeat to get a sweep against the champion. The ending was a little anticlimactic and the run itself wasn't particularly difficult. Tedious at times, but that doesn't equal difficulty. Overall though, I really enjoyed this run. I actually had more fun with it than even the last two F tier runs I've done. Which, if you made it this far into the video, you should definitely check those out now by clicking the links coming up on your screen. This video concludes the trilogy of games I knew I wanted to do F tier runs in when I first started the channel, but going off of the last poll I put out, you guys clearly want more. So tell me in the comments down below, what game would you like to see added to the series? What are some Pokemon you personally think fit for the run? I might use them in future videos. You can also likely expect some upcoming tier list live streams, so be sure to have notifications on if you want to be able to contribute to those as well, where we'll be making lists for future runs there. But until then, thank you all so much for watching, and I will catch y'all in the next run. See ya.